more accurately and you'll be able to um, particularly to help them with their uh, grammar and vocabulary, extending their vocabulary um, when they're speaking and writing um, about uh, curriculum related content that you're working with them on. So let's begin with the question of, um, well, let's define what substitution tables are, first of all. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this, but if you're not, um, I'll give you a quick description. So here is an example because um, obviously the best, uh, the best thing to do is to simply show you what we're talking about. Um, as you can see, a substitution table is a table which breaks down sentences into smaller manageable chunks and divides these chunks into different columns. Learners then choose one element at a time from each column to create a sentence. So for example, you can see here we have um, a table based on uh, the Dickens book, A Christmas Carol. Um, a learner could look at this table and they could create the following sentence. Scrooge is happy when he realizes it is Christmas day. Um, all this information is, is also provided um, in the Bell Foundation um, resources, great ideas page on substitution tables, um, but we'll provide a link for that um, later in the webinar. So don't worry about that. At the moment. So the beauty of substitution tables is that the grammatical order of each sentence is fixed. Um, so for example, a learner would always choose something from column one, two, and then three, four, and five. Um, you would never ask a learner to choose something from column five, and then column three, and then column four. Okay, so it's, it's not a mix and match. Um, the fixed nature of the order from left to right means that the cognitive load is reduced um, um, as the order of the sentence is one less thing that learners have to process. So this is particularly useful for um, <clears throat> um, developing learners' uh, understanding of the word order in English. Um, and it's particularly useful, um, as in many languages, the word order differs to English. Um, if we think about languages like German or or Japanese, where the verb comes at the end of a sentence. Um, so this is a great way of reinforcing those structures. Um, and then the choice for the learners comes in each column. So they can choose whichever word they want to help them make a um, viable sentence. Um, and we'll look a bit more at that in more detail later. Um, so the idea is that there's choice. So when or what are they used for? Well, substitution tables can be used to help learners scaffold their talk um, during a discussion or a, 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 a oral activity, um, and also their writing, of course. And the key thing, um, the key function really of substitution tables is to have a particular language focus um, to support the development of a particular feature. So through this language focus, the table provides a way to scaffold the writing or speaking, um, and it helps learners to practice the particular language focus within the context of the curriculum um, and the particular language requirements of the content that you're teaching. So um, let's get down to actually, how do we make these things? So. Um, it's probably something that you may have done before, of course, and you may not have really thought about it in great detail, but we're going to look at a possible process for creating a substitution table. OK, um, so the first thing to do is obviously select or create a text based on the content you're teaching in your lesson. Um, next, you need to analyze the text and identify a language focus. Um, that your learners might need support with, okay? Um, and this is probably the most complicated part of the process, actually. Um, it might be the case that there is not a language feature that repeatedly occurs in the text, uh, in, which in, in which case the text is not suitable to turn into a substitution table, okay? We'd want to use a, a different strategy to support learners. 
Um, this is because substitution tables provide learners with the opportunity to repeatedly practice one key um, language focus. So you've um, analyzed your text. Um, if you're not a, a language specialist or an EL specialist, um, this is where you might seek help from colleagues, um, this, this sort of analysis stage. You might want to um, speak to an EAL specialist or, uh, or, or somebody who perhaps has learned English as a second language themselves and has a good understanding of, of English grammar and, and what, what areas you might want to focus on. Okay, um, we will give you some examples of, of language focuses as we, as we move through. There'll be lots and lots of examples that will come, um, so don't worry uh, about that. We're just talking about the process here. So once we've got the focus, we decide how to divide um, the sentence from you, you decide how you might divide each sentence from your text. Um, each, each sentence will contain one example of your language focus. Um, and you want to do that into manageable chunks. And again, this will depend on the proficiency of your learners, which we'll talk about later. And you may want to sketch this out onto a piece of paper first um, to figure this out. As you get more conf confident, you may be able to do these things more spontaneously on the board. Um, and then you can transfer all these chunks into the substitution table. Uh, then, of course, you're ready to use them with your learners in the class to help them practice writing or speaking about the topic um, that's being taught in that lesson. Um, I think it's really important to remember to make sure that um, the content covered in the table and any key subject vocabulary is taught to your learners before they use the substitution table. Okay, The substitution table shouldn't be the first time they're seeing a lot of this language. This is because substitution tables are there to provide practice of um, key language focus, which learners have already encountered, but may not be, um, may not have mastered yet. So if they don't know, um, if they don't know this content vocabulary, this will cause um, an extra level of unnecessary cognitive challenge um, and is likely to make, uh, make it less successful. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So here's a, an example of how you might analyze a text for key language. So um, the barrier to learning that learners with EAL experience is, is with their English language, um, not with uh, necessarily their, their content knowledge or, or other cognitive skills. So whatever we do needs to teach them an area of English language grammar or vocabulary. Um, we can't teach them everything at the same time, so we need to make judicious choices as to what to focus on to support our learners. Um, often you'll work with texts that are pre-written for you, for example, a page in a textbook. Therefore, you need to analyze such texts to establish what language demands they might place on the learners in your classroom. And so what you're looking for really is, is a repeating pattern or a grammatical or lexical uh, regularity. So, you know, a particular vocabulary feature that reoccurs or a particular grammatical structure that reoccurs in your text and your in your subject. So um, in the example from this slide, we can see it's a geography lesson um, at secondary level. And we can um, we have identified that um, since the text is presenting lots of facts about tropical storms, the tense that is used, the grammatical tense, is always the present tense. OK, the technical term would be the present simple or the simple present. For example, topical, tropical storms occur, not tropical storms are occurring or tropical storms have occurred. Tropical storms occur, this is the present. And um, you can, we can identify the following um, present tense verbs in these sentences. Okay, let's, um, let's turn it over to you now. Um, I'll give you a short task. So um, I want you to look at this text from a um, primary um, source um, about history, and the topic is Queen Elizabeth I. So if you were to create a substitution table based on the short text below, what would be your language focus? Um, I'll give you uh, 30 seconds, a minute to think about that, and you can type your answers in the chat box.
okay there's a definite theme to people's reply so far everyone's saying the past simple or simple past okay well i think i think we're in a, some agreement here aren't we and, and if you wrote the past tense or the past simple test then yes we would agree with you that seems like a really obvious language point here to pick out of this text um, you can see here that we've highlighted six examples of the past simple being used um, we could therefore construct a substitution table that would check a learner's understanding of this particular um, aspect of grammar and i'm going to show you how you might do that so um, on the left, you can see the text, just so we keep that in mind. And on the right, you can see a, a template of a substitution table. So um, first, as you can see, we've divided the table into three vertical sections, the subject, the verb, and the object or complement. Um, the complement just being the word or phrase that is needed to complete the meaning of an expression, uh, in this case, after the verb. So we have that basic structure. Um, so we can add the subjects first. So we can see that in um, the um, in the second sentence, she is used. Um, we also have she. Yeah, we have she used twice, and then we have England um, as a subject in one um, one clause as well, and Elizabeth as well, um, and some people. Um, so because our table only includes subject, verb, and object, we're excluding the so although part of the sentence. So although she was queen, because um, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit in with our structure and it's just gonna cause some confusion. Um, so we included these subjects. Next, we move to the verbs. So you can see these are the ones that we've previously highlighted. Now you'll see that while most of them are one word verbs, such as ruled, felt, approved, there is also the negative construction of did not discover. So um, in this case, we're going to shorten it to didn't to make it um, easier for our EL learners. And um, that's because um, in this case, um, where I'm imagining that I'm going to use this table for a spoken activity. Um, so it's appropriate to use a more informal um, register. So um, we would use contractions like didn't rather than did not. But if it was for writing, I might keep as did not. Um, one other structure we can notice there is um, in the text is that um, England had no king. Okay, so this sentence structure is the same as England didn't have a king. Now, in this case, if my learners are quite low proficiency, I don't really want to confuse them with this extra construction, okay? Um, which is quite uh, sort of academic and, and, and not very common and, and certainly not used very often in spoken English. So um, we would just, we've just removed that and we've added the verb have, so they can say didn't have, England didn't have a king. Um, that's, that's absolutely fine, it has the same meaning. Um, you'll also, um, so you also notice then that um, because of the level of the students, we've provided all the verbs and their forms that go with didn't at the top and all the um, verb forms that go with the positive sentence at the bottom. Um, and this allows the learner to write didn't have, didn't rule, or simply had or ruled. Um, it means they can't make common mistakes like didn't ruled or didn't felt, you know, the sort of double negative, which um which is quite common with learners using the past simple with the auxiliary verb didn't. Um, you will notice that the verb was um, is only in the second row and there is no verb to be in the top row. Um, and that's because simply because saying didn't be is grammatically impossible in English. So we don't want to include that option because um, yeah, it's just going to cause confusion and potentially lead to mistakes. Um, and finally, we add the objects and complements of the sentences in the final column. Okay, um, so um, you'll notice that the objects are not listed in the same order as the sentences in the text, because that would then just make it a very simple kind of 
matching task and there's no challenge there and they don't even need to understand the language to be able to do it. So we've randomized them in order to make it um, a challenge and to actually, for them to actually process the meaning of the, the language. Um, and so there you go, that's basically how you, you might go away, uh, go about creating a substitution table um, for this text. Um, one other thing to mention is that on this table, we included the headings, um, subject, verb, and object. Um, however, I've put that in there mainly for you um, for the, as, as teachers um, to think about, but um, with lower proficiency learners, especially at primary level, um, you may want to remove the grammatical headings. Um, of course, this will depend on your context and to what extent grammar and the terminology around grammar is explicitly taught in your school and, and the extent to which you yourself and your students are comfortable with talking about grammar as well. But um, they're certainly not necessary. And in fact, they could they could well prove confusing and a barrier for some learners. So, um, you know, unless you know that your learners are quite confident with that kind of grammatical language, I would recommend leaving those out. Okay, um, the next thing to consider then is how to use the substitution table, is, is how to um, help your learners use the tables themselves. So if they've never seen them before, they will need some support in how to use them. And of course, um, the easiest Thing to do is simply uh, provide a visual example. Um, you can draw lines on the board or on the on the on the handout um, to show where they um, to show how they pick one element from each column, and that it makes a sentence. So we have here some examples. Um, it's always a good idea to do an example together with everyone before letting the learners go away and try it on their own. So you can do one at the board together and then they can go away and uh, use it independently. Okay. Um, so that's how to create one. Now let's look at some of the key features and some of the sort of do's and don'ts of making a, an effective substitution table. Um, so again, here's another quick task for you. Um, there are two examples of substitution tables, A, example A, example B. Um, one of these examples I think is more effective than the other. So take, uh, again, sort of 30 seconds or a minute or so to look at the substitution tables and consider them and um, write in the chat box which letter you think is the more effective one and why. Claudia, that's a good question. We're going to come to that. Uh, we'll come to that. We'll talk about that later. Okay, lots of people um, writing an answer there, but also give us give us a reason why um, I want to see your your thinking. What's your justification for choosing? Okay, some some really good comments coming up. Okay, there's some uh, excellent responses. Yeah, practicing B is practicing too many things. Some people saying A is too easy. Well, that's, uh, that's possible. Okay, A is very specific. Yeah, okay. All right, some really good responses coming here. Um, I'm going to move on. And I think almost everyone agreed that A was the more effective table. And I think most of the reasons um, I would give for that were mentioned. So first of all, there is a clear focus on an element of English grammar. Um, and in this case, it's the present simple using is or are. OK. Um, the th in the third column ask the learner to choose between the two different forms of the verb to show that they understand when to use the singular uh, and plural form of the verb to be. Um, so this, we're using this, you know, with learners who are probably fairly early in their um, language acquisition journey, um, and it allows them to operate in their zone of 
proximal development. So that is to say, it, it appears to teach them a grammatical concept that's just outside their current understanding. So you'd be using it with learners where you notice that they consistently mix up is and are and they don't use them appropriately, or perhaps they only use is and they haven't started using are very often. Um, it might be the case that they've only just learned to use the verb is um, in the singular and are beginning to use the plural are. Um, and this one step at a time approach has much more potential to be successful than the sudden exposure to like five different tenses used in table B. Um, now, someone mentioned that, you know, table A is, is simpler um, um, than table B, and that's true. And of course, you have to bear in mind the level of your students. Um, but there are other reasons why A is a more effective um, substitution table. Um, and again, people mentioned that A is linked to academic language is linked to an aspect of the curriculum. Okay, this is language that they're going to need. Obviously, this is a biology lesson um, and it's the grammar is clearly linked with the curriculum. Um, uh, whereas table B looks like it was probably taken out of a English as a foreign language book for children learning English. Um, and that's not necessarily a problem in and of itself, but the language there about learning about Salma going shopping or Rashid playing video games is not going to help um, learners with their with their curriculum language. Um, and you'll notice also um, that in table B, there are too many choices really. In the second column, there's a choice of five different tenses, which is just going to confuse the majority of students. OK, and remember, the aim of a substitution table is to reduce the cognitive load. So the list of choices should either be quite limited, um, especially if it's a new language, or if it's a longer list, like with the vocabulary here, we should be using words that learners have encountered before, or at least where we've provided them with some visuals or some translations, okay? Because otherwise, again, the, the, they'll be too busy focusing on figuring out what the word means to even think about the structure of the sentence. Um, and finally, I think this is a sort of key point. Table A allows the learners to write a large number of different grammatically correct sentences um, from a very simple table that would not take very long to, for a teacher to create. OK, I mean, we could write this up on the board. Um, I can imagine doing something like this quite spontaneously where I write the and then I say to, and then I can draw two lines um, to represent the first the second column. And I would say to students, OK, what you know what body parts did we learn about last lesson or or earlier and then we you know they can give me their suggestions and we can write them up and if they miss any we can i can add them to that list and then is and are part of the and then again i can elicit from the students okay so you know we learned about different systems in the body what different systems do you remember okay write those up on the board and then you know on the board we have a nice um we have a nice set uh structure which allows the creation of lots of different um, language but didn't take me a lot of time which is kind of very important and we're all very busy and we've got lots of um, other uh, demands on our time and this would be the other round other way around with table b it takes quite it would take longer to create that table um, and it doesn't it doesn't actually isn't that linguistically um, uh, productive because a lot of a lot of it is still dead ends because it's dependent on these different grammar tenses. So a lot of the combinations don't make any sense. Um, and that may be helpful for learners to practice their grammar at a higher level, but generally it's probably something we want to avoid. OK, now let's um, analyze the sort of types of substitution tables we can um, we can use and when we might use them. Um, so here are two types of substitution tables that you might encounter or want to use. So the first would be a content only um, substitution table. And the next one would be a content and language choice together. Um, so let's give you some examples. The content only choice here is a, taken from a primary history lesson. Um, and the language focus here is the past simple, which you can see by looking at the second column with the verbs flew, made, and studied. Um, but this is example of a content only because the learners don't actually have any choices to make related to the language focus, okay? Because whichever choices they make will be grammatical, will be correct. So they will always correct, they will always pick a correct past simple verb 
because there are only correct past simple verbs to choose from. And all of the subjects in the first column agree with the past simple verbs in the middle column. However, excuse me, they could still make a sentence that doesn't make sense in terms of content. So, you know, the Wright brothers made flights of birds, which is grammatically correct, but doesn't make any sense from a, from a sort of content real world point of view. Um, and then we've also added pictures in the substitution table to provide further support. So this would be an example of the sort of less, the least demanding type of substitution table. Um, and we would probably use this with the lowest proficiency learners, those that use the most, those that require the most support. Um, here's another example. Um, this time we've added content and language, uh, a la content and language choice. And this is um, from a secondary science lesson. So again, the language, um, the language focus here is using the present simple to talk about facts. And again, you'll see the list of verbs. There's a list of present simple verbs. Have, are, contain, and can. The table gives learners the choice over the content, but also some of the language because they need to choose the correct type of cell from the first column and then the verb and the remaining part of the sentence. Um, for example, red blood cells contain hemoglobin. So in this sense, learners choose the content, but there is the possibility that they could choose something that is factually incorrect, such as red blood cells contain lots of chloroplasts, but there's also the chance they can make something that's also linguistically um, wrong as well. Um, so they also need to make language choices. So the choice, they, the first choice they need to make um, between the first and second column will depend on what they choose in the last column for it to make sense. So for example, if they want to talk about red blood cells, they can choose any of the, in theory, they can choose any of the verbs in the middle column and that would make sense. However, this will depend on how they choose to finish the sentence. So for example, they could create a sentence that reads, red blood cells contain large, which would be grammatically incorrect. Um, because of course with large, we it's an adjective, which means we typically would use it with the verb to be. So the only possible um, partner with large is are. Um, and so that, you know, students will have to do that processing and not have that thought process when they're considering the, um, their choices. Okay. There is an example. All right. So this is the example I think we've already seen from an English lesson on the Christmas Carol, um, probably at the kind of primary level. And the language focus here is also the present simple. Um, here, the table gives learners choice over both content and language again. Um, but this table actually allows more choice over what language to select, as the learners need to choose the correct subject in this case, um, and the correct um, verb, so that there's subject verb agreement. So for example, we have Bob Cratchit, which is singular, which needs to be followed by is or feels. And we also have the cratchits, which is plural and needs to be followed with R or feel. Um, so the student has to make that choice. Um, also, the fact that the table has been divided into more parts also provides more choice as there are more elements to choose from and they can, there's more um, possible sentences can be created. Um, and again, you might want to use this type of substitution table to see if your learners understand subject verb agreement um, or practice it if you notice that it's something they often make mistakes with. Um, which is which is very common um, up to certainly more quite advanced levels. It's something that students um, tend to struggle with, even if they know it and they've been taught it. They often struggle to produce it when it comes to speaking and writing. OK, um, and I think this is our last example in this section. It's um, this is a, a substitution table from a science lesson at secondary level. Um, the language focus here is articles. And um, again, this one's probably a little bit more complicated um, because students need to look at the pictures um, and identify the different cells. So again, we're assuming that this has been pre-taught in, in an earlier lesson or an earlier part of this lesson. Um, they need to remember the name of the cell and then decide if they need to use um, the article a or the article an, which of course depends on the um, sound at the beginning of the word and the spelling. So that's going to 
it's going to force them to think about the the sound and the spellings of these words that they've learned um, so again learners got choice over content and language um, and there's also an additional level of challenge here because the teachers replaced the words with pictures so you're adding to the cognitive load because there's now this also vocabulary um, recollection aspect to the task um, which again it can be um, a very useful way of uh, of reinforcing new vocabulary that you have taught. Um, if you wanted to add more support here, of course, you could have the names of the cells um, at a little vocabulary box at the bottom for them to choose from um, or write them on the board. Um, or you could put perhaps the first letter of the cell under each picture, because again, that's going to help them um, A, remember what the cell is called and B, it's going to help them understand if it's A or an more easily. So these, you know, you can you can make little tweaks to these according to the um, to the ability of your of your learners. And maybe even within the same class, you know, you could make different sets of, of handouts and give them to different groups of learners as appropriate. Um, and of course, this is also testing their functional, um, their knowledge of the content, their knowledge of the function of a cell, because they will need to choose, although all the options are grammatical on the right, that they will need to choose the correct one to uh, match the function of the cell. Okay, oh, and there was one more, um, and this is the most sort of complicated example I think we've got here. Um, obviously this is from a secondary um, English lesson about um, the Shakespeare play Macbeth. Um, again, the focus here is also on the present simple. Um, and the table here again is a language and content table. Um, and this is more cognitively demanding simply because it provides more columns and therefore more choice. Um, similar to the Christmas Carol table, it makes learners choose between which subject agrees with which verb. Um, and when using this table to create sentences, the learner needs to hold a lot of information in their minds. So this is going to add the cognitive load, um, especially as there are lots of possible sentences that can be created. So again, we're using this perhaps with a higher proficiency, uh, well, a higher not necessarily high proficiency, sorry, higher uh, cognitive um, level of development. So we're talking, you know, secondary learners who are able to deal with this level of uh, cognitive challenge. Um, at primary level, this would probably be um, over overdoing it because because even you know even a first language speaker of um, the language is just going to get overloaded with too much information like this. So. Um, to summarize then, um, we can look at this table as a sort of summary. Um, on the up down axis on this chart, we have the level of challenge. Um, and at, lower, at the lowest end, we have uh, content only choice substitution tables. Um, make, if we want to make them more challenging, we can add content and language choices. And of course, we've already seen that we can vary the complexity there. Um, and at the highest level of challenge, there is no substitution table. We're just, you know, we just let the participants, uh, we let the students do the, uh, create the language themselves. Um, okay, how are we doing for time? We're okay. So in your classes, I'd imagine that many of you, if not all of you will have more than one Yale learner, if you're working in, in an international context. And also they're very likely to be at different levels of, um, language acquisition. Uh, so one useful skill is to be able to adapt or change the same substitution table for different language levels in a, in a quick and easy fashion. Okay, so this section is going to focus on how, how we can do that. Um, all right, so um, here's a, another example of a table we've already looked at. Um, please uh, look at the table and suggest how you could alter this table to firstly provide less language support so if you have learners who are slightly stronger how would you make this more challenging or um, how would you um, help them to practice more complex structures like could you change the whole uh, structure of these sentences to make them more complex so yeah, how would you add complexity to this table? Um, have a think, give you a minute or two, and you can, um, once you've had a think, you can write your answers in the chat box.
Okay, some, some good suggestions coming through here. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's some really good suggestions coming through. I'm just reading all your suggestions. Um, I recommend you have a little scroll through and see what other people have written. Okay. So we, we have some really excellent suggestions there. Um, and um, I'm going to give you what um, some possible ways that we thought you could uh, achieve this. Uh, but add, to add more. So to sorry, to adapt for less support, um, I think somebody's already mentioned um, one simple way would be to simply remove the captions accompanying the pictures. Um, now then now you only have the images so they have to remember um and they have to sort of or or, or provide their own version of uh, of the language um so they already need to know words like kite brothers and birds in order to, to construct the sentences um so unless you've pre-taught that language um it's that's not always a great idea to do um unless you're going to provide them with a, uh, a bilingual dictionary um so the learners can find these words in their own language um but um, assuming that you think they have that vocabulary knocking around in their brains, then it's a, it's a nice way of adding to the challenge. Um, in terms of adding complexity, um, definitely for more advanced learners, we, the, the, the grammar structure in the, in the original example was quite basic, wasn't it? It was present, um, sorry, past simple. So here we see we've changed the structure to um, make it more formal or academic by using the passive. So we've introduced was and were um, as a component of the passive voice. For example, was made, was flown. Um, and we haven't, we've continued to have no text around the images. Um, and another thing you could do, as somebody I think has mentioned, um, is add gaps. So take away the verbs um, and students have to produce them themselves. Um, and the, the missing verbs here, it's important to know are the past participle. Um, in, in the passive form, so as in built or was built. Um, although again, you may or may not want to mention the terminology to the learners, depending on their sort of language awareness. Um, and another technique, um, which I'm not sure was mentioned, um, is you could, uh, you could ban the use of certain words. If this is good if you want to extend their range of expression, because um, you know, learners tend to stick with what they're comfortable with. So if we're, if we're at the higher level, we want to stretch them, we want to make them use more formal or sophisticated language. So for example, instead of um, made, they could use built or created. Um, instead of flown, they could use piloted. Um, instead of studied, they could use um, explored, um, and things like that. Um, again, you would only use that with a, with a group that you know that you know they have more language knocking around in their heads perhaps and you're kind of pushing them to to use it <laughs> uh, otherwise they tend to go for the for the easy version um there were some really other really nice um ideas that, that were suggested actually i think um people uh someone suggested things like um adding connectives to extending the sentence yeah absolutely that's another way of making them more complex um people talked about um adding extra column to order the events for sort of um, words like first and then. And yeah, I agree, that would be a really productive way of um, generating it. Um, someone's put add adverbs. And I think that is really, that's often a really um, useful uh, way to develop language. I think in this, in this context, it's not a creative writing task. It's quite factual. So I don't know if in this genre of write, uh, you, would, you would use it. Personally, I wouldn't. Put those in here but i mean absolutely it's a really productive way if you have verbs of, of building that range of expression in there so um yeah um and yeah i think as claudia's again said 
giving the initial letters of verbs, yeah, would be another way of uh, modifying the level of challenge by making it slightly less, slightly easier. Absolutely. So yeah, really nice um, ideas there, everybody. Thank you. Um, so the next couple of slides will show how one initial substitution table could be adapted for learners with different levels. So let's start with this one, which is the one we've already seen about the Christmas Carol book. So um, let's say we want to extend the challenge a little bit. Um, we could go from this to this one for a slightly more advanced learner. So here we're going to release the control of the language slightly and use both content and language choice. So we've removed the horizontal line um, in the second column. So we've gone from is, feels, are, feel, uh, the line to no line. So it means that they have to, um, they mean that they can make grammatical errors here if they choose the wrong verb. So they need to think about that more carefully. And in the right-hand column, you've seen we've added more um, options um, and you'll see we've either used um, the uh, we've used the two different forms of the present simple so either arrive or arrives realizes realize come comes and so on so again they have to choose the correct one that agrees with the um, the subject so um, in this type of substitution table some options are not possible to use so it's part of the learner's task to eliminate the unnecessary options. OK, so and, and um, we should make that um, explicitly um, clear to the students that, that some of these options don't make sense so that they don't just think they can combine anything together. Um, so this, anyway, this would allow us really easily to check their understanding of these aspects of language. Um, and in, um, we can see how well they can use the present simple tense verbs. Um, yeah, and we need to make them aware that not all these options are possible. OK, so for to take it to, an, to another step, um, we might want them to use the present simple tense correctly, but we also want them to use more advanced vocabulary. And this is personally where I find myself using substitution tables a lot. Um, so here, the person who mentioned adverbs, um, here we come with some adverbs. So um, we have some adverbs and adjectives added to. Um, so we've extended the number of adjectives um, and we'll be introducing we've also introduced some errors so actually you'll see the spell checks already picked up that surprisingly isn't actually used in standard english which students may not be aware of because if you can say cheerful cheerfully delighted delightedly why can't you say surprisingly and um in you know in standard in written english we don't really use it although in spoken english Maybe people may use it. Um, so again, we we can we, this we can use this to highlight differences like that. Um, so you can also um, by you know providing both adjectives and adverbs, we're kind of making them think about the use of those two different types of language. Because in because in English, um, verbs some verbs can only be followed by um, um, adjectives, uh, other verbs, uh, and when other languages, that's um, you you can you can follow verbs with um, uh, adverbs such as uh, so you know things like feel in English are followed by adjectives. We don't say feel happily, but we can say feel happy, whereas other languages don't necessarily have that distinction. So this is a good thing to raise students' awareness of. OK, without, let's not get into too much grammatical uh, weeds. And let's have a look then at um, a quick task for you. Here are three uh, substitution tables, and they each have different levels of challenge. So have a look at them and put them in order of challenge. So um, one would be least challenging, and three would be the most challenging. So you can just write the letters in in the order of least challenging to most challenging. I'll give you a minute or so to think about that. OK, 
again, it seems to be <laughs> we seem to be in agreement. <laughs> uh, here. All right. Well, let's um, move on. As I'm aware that we're we started late, I'll try and wrap this up a little bit quickly. So yeah, the least challenging substitution table here would be A. Um, I think this might be given to a sort of early acquisition learner. Um, if we're thinking about the framework, the found Bell Foundation's framework, you're talking about band A to B, um, probably band B. And here there is no possibility to make errors around the use of the present simple tense verbs. Um, it's always cells in the left hand column um, and it will always agree with the verb. Um, but there is a possibility to make errors around content or language in the third column, but not around our language focus, which is the present simple. Um, so the medium challenge here, we would argue is actually B. Um, so this is the substitution table that um, you might give to learners who are sort of developing competence. Um, not only do the learners have to choose the correct verb from the second column, they also need to decide um, whether the articles a or a, a or an are needed in the gaps um, or if they're not needed at all because with some verbs uncountable verbs like hemoglobin uh, uncountable verbs uncountable nouns like hemoglobin we don't need articles um, and in this case um, the focus here is is on articles okay not just anything so there is there is a sort of very specific language focus here which means that the the level of challenges is modified okay and the most complex one then would be this table um, and that's because um, the learners will already be able to use articles we think at this level they're more advanced we think they're sort of get they've, they've, their English is quite well developed so instead we've removed the words acting as adjectives here and we're not providing um, a word list for them so this is actually quite challenging because then they need to this calls for more sophisticated use of language okay so we have both content and language to think about um, there are no answers provided although if you wanted to support them of course you could more you could provide a a word bank um, and this is really making them think about the kind of sophisticated academically appropriate language that you would use that you would expect them to start using at a sort of higher level uh, possibly um, I may be B and C wrong around in which case you're all correct and um, I, I made a mistake in the order as possible that was a mistake in the slides I apologize if that's the case so um, um, to reiterate then what we've said before the important, the most important thing is there is a discrete language focus, um, and um, here that it's the adjectives that were being used. Okay, so to summarise, um, here are some questions that you might want to ask yourself when you're creating a substitution table. I'll just let you read those. So I think this is um, this concludes the the main part of the presentation, um, and um, there's a there is a few minutes if those if you can stick around for another five minutes. We started ten minutes late, so I'm going to keep going. Um, and I appreciate some people will have to leave, um, but um, if you have any questions, um, you can um, ask them now. I can see somebody's mentioned. Um, what activity follows a substitution table? So, I mean, I can address that one straight away. Well, um, typically um, it's used as, I wouldn't say it's used as part of an activity. So a substitution table is just the first part in some kind of production activity. So either a writing activity or a speaking activity. So they, they have the substitution table and then it, the substitution table is what enables them to better participate in the writing or speaking task. 
Um, someone's asked, can I go back one slide? Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it on this slide because this is the useful one. We will we will provide a, a, a copy, a link to a recording of this um, in case you need to, uh, in case you want to recap on anything. Um, and um, yeah, the types of activities that you would use these in. I mean, um, I often, if you have some kind of discussion activity, it can be very helpful. Um, if you have often um, writing, often there, if there's a writing task, you know, to summarize a particular or answer a particular question, you, you might want to have a substitution table there um, for, you know, in subjects like, uh, like history or or English, whether um, geography, where they off, people often have to sort of justify or ex uh, explain things. Um, and um, Natalie is asking, um, can substitution tables be used for creative writing? Absolutely, and I, I mean, I find them very useful for that um, as an English teacher. Um, you know, again, I'm thinking about how to, it's often, I find it most useful in terms of extending students' range of expression. Students will often say, you know, everything was nice. It was very good. It was nice. Instead of nice, we can make a nice substitution table and we can add lots of different options for them. This is especially useful at, you know, again, lower proficiency levels when they're just sort of building up their, their competence. Um, um, it works really well for things like, yeah, adjectives and, and that kind of language in, in creative writing. Um, Any other questions? And, I think yeah, oh, yeah, Tom, we've had a few questions before the webinar, and I think one just now as well about tweaking substitution tables for younger children or even children who are still learning to read. Yes. So I think what you can you can definitely I mean you can use them. Um the idea of a substitution table is it it allows students to work more independently. Um obviously with with um, early years children or, or, or lower primary children they're less able to do that anyway so rather than but I you do I you can still use substitution tables in terms of presenting the kind of language that you want students to to produce but I would do it more collectively um, rather than perhaps give individual um, handouts to students which is something that works well at, at, at higher ages um, and then let them go and work on it independently. So, for example, on the board, you you know you can have your very simple sentence construction. Um, I don't know. Let's see. Um, my favorite food is blank. Okay, and then we can make a uh, you can create a nice substitution table where you can put the you can put the words on the board so those students who are beginning to understand reading can understand it. Um, can practice their reading, but you, you would probably use images instead of words to as, the, as a substitution. Um, so then, you know, they don't need to be able to read, you know, my favorite food is, and then you can ask them to make, uh, you can make, ask them to make um, sentences with it um, orally. Um, if they're not writing yet, they can just produce things orally. Um, you know, you can make them more complex. Um, so, you know, my favorite, food is well okay so we can change food can't we so we can change my favorite um color is my favorite animal is and uh and you know and then and then they can make their own um they can make their own sentences um yeah i mean it really i like i like substitution tables in that way with younger children because they can they enjoy making like silly sentences so you can sometimes mix up categories so you might have food and animal my favorite food or animal and then you could have different foods and animals on the, on the other column and they have to so they could make a sentence like my favorite food is gorilla or my favorite animal is a pizza and obviously you know they enjoy making up those silly kind of sentences um yeah so basically it's focusing more on the visuals and keeping it very simple um and if you do make it more complex you do it very sort of slowly um, and you kind of build it up over time. Um, but it is, 
it is but and, and using it more as a whole class teaching thing rather than as an as something you put on a handout perhaps um, especially until the learners are able to read uh, independently um okay. substitution tables alongside actions yeah perfect that's a really good that's a really good strategy yeah um definitely um do you have any good source of academic visuals that are in one place? Um, I don't think I know one off the top of my head. I mean, we use, you know, the free to, there are various free um, image libraries on the internet. Um, um, but um, yeah, I, off the top of my head, sorry, I can't, I can't remember the ones that we often use. Yeah, I, I'd say it's, it's quite uh, difficult to find the yeah, free, comprehensive one i know for example mm -hmm. wikimedia commons has a lot of uh, free um you know images that can be uh, used for different subjects but i think usually if you want a comprehensive um library usually they tend to be paid yes pixabay is great but again some i think some types of images are very easily found but i remember when i was updating some resources on ancient egypt and romans i, I found it quite difficult to find specific images there um so yeah um how much time we've got? we haven't got much time. i mean julie's saying how do we use you know the weak readers well yeah as i said it's all about using images i think relying on images a lot um potentially um translations if they're already literate in their in their home language as well but mm. um but certainly images are your friend really um, um yeah. yes yeah and i i would say tom thank you very much for the presentation for the talk uh, i think we'll need to wrap up now because yes. a lot of people need to leave but i wanted to say again apologies for the technical difficulties at the beginning we will email a recording of the webinar to everyone so if you missed the start or if you know someone who who missed the webinar they will receive the recording via email could we also ask you before we finish uh charlie has shared a link in the chat to a brief survey on the webinar you know your feedback is really important to us and uh, so if you could complete the survey that would be much appreciated um, and i have a few announcements if you have a couple more minutes before you leave just that might be of interest to you or some of your colleagues um, so this was the, the last Language for Results International webinar in this academic year, but we will be running further Language for Results International courses from September. The first two that we're offering will be focused on EAL assessment, assessing the language proficiency of learners with EAL, which is aimed at teaching staff and starts on the 15th of September. And we also have embedding the assessment of EAL learners proficiency, which is aimed at school leaders with responsibility for EAL provision. And that starts on the 20th of October. The international webinar series will also return in the new academic year. So please keep an eye on the website or even better sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss out on any of uh, the Language for Results International updates. And if you are based in the UK, we still have a couple more courses that will be starting in June. One is on supporting new arrivals for who are new to English that starts on the 14th of June and you'll be ready for the new academic year. And then a course for teaching assistance, which starts on the 21st of June. And again, if you need any further information on our courses or webinars that will be running in the autumn, you can find everything on the website. So thank you very much again for taking part in today's webinar. 